Thursday, September 24th. Welcome back. If you're just joining us for the first time today, we're happy to have you with us. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we can't go in person to the State House in Trenton, but we're so pleased that you can join us from the comfort and safety of your home. In this hour long day at the Capitol, you'll hear from your New Jersey legislators on issues that matter to you, your family, and all New Jerseyans. These issues include supporting property tax relief, lowering prescription drug prices, reforming long-term care facilities, and making utilities affordable. You'll also have the opportunity to ask questions of your elected leaders. Now, before we get started, I want to share that this call is being recorded. There may be reporters on the call, so it's possible that you'll be quoted if you choose to share a comment or question. During the Zoom meeting, your microphone will be muted until you're invited to speak. We do invite you to have your video on so everyone can see each other. The chat box will be limited to private messages to the host of the Zoom meeting. If you'd like to ask one of your legislators a question, please type it into the chat to our associate state director labeled India Questions. If you have a technical question, please type it into the chat to our volunteer labeled Dan Tech Questions. And if you're being asked to share your question live, you will be prompted with host would like to unmute you. Then click the blue button and unmute yourself. For months, AARP New Jersey has been advocating for the state to restore two significant property tax relief programs, the senior freeze and homestead benefit, since these programs were cut in the spring. The homestead benefit program provides property tax relief to almost 580,000 New Jersey homeowners, while the senior freeze program supports approximately 157 thousand of New Jersey's seniors and residents with disabilities. Later today, the governor will sign the new state budget, which restores the senior freeze and homestead benefit. We commend the governor and the legislature for restoring both programs in the state budget. New Jerseyans, particularly older residents and residents with disabilities who live on low, moderate, and fixed incomes have always struggled with New Jersey's high property taxes. And now families have been hit especially hard because of the economic and health crisis created by the pandemic. So we are pleased to know that the senior freeze and the homestead benefit will be restored in the state budget. This will support our most vulnerable population during a time of unprecedented financial crisis. We're also pleased that the budget includes startup funds to implement the New Jersey Secure Choice Retirement Savings Program. This public-private partnership will provide a much needed opportunity for more than half of New Jersey's private sector workforce that doesn't have a way to save for retirement at work. We thank all of the AARP members and urge them to restore the funding to these two critical property tax relief programs. We know it's the voices of people like you who protect the financial security that all New Jerseyans deserve. We thank you. And now I'm gonna turn over the floor to AARP New Jersey Director of Advocacy, Ev Liebman. Ev is going to moderate the rest of today's virtual day at the Capitol. Ev has spent her career advocating for New Jerseyans. She's been influential in ensuring long-term care residents and staff are protected, especially during the coronavirus pandemic. Ev is a lead advocate fighting for our financial security, ensuring that our utilities are affordable and ensuring that all New Jerseyans can remain in their communities where they want to be. Recently, Ev served on the Governor's Coronavirus Restart and Recovery Advisory Council's Healthcare Committee and the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Ev, thank you for all that you do, and thank you so much for moderating today. Thank you so much, Lavelle, and thank you to all who have joined us this morning for, as you heard from Lavelle, our very first uh, 
virtual day at the Capitol, like so much uh, of our lives during um, during this COVID-19 pandemic, um, our work has changed. Uh, but, uh, but what has not changed um, is uh, our work to ensure the financial and health security of our 1.3 million members here in New Jersey and the 50 plus here and around the nation. As you heard from Lavelle, uh, we have a very packed day today. Um, and uh, we are indeed concluding today, not just our second virtual day at the Capitol, uh, but in just a short few hours, Governor Murphy is planning on signing uh, the new fiscal year 2021 state budget, uh, which as you've heard from Lavelle, uh, includes some very significant AARP priorities, including property tax relief for our seniors and residents with disabilities. Um, you're also gonna hear about uh, some of the legislation that has recently passed uh, and been enacted and, and is right now sitting on the governor's desk to reform our nursing homes and other long-term care facilities, which have been so ravaged by the COVID-19 pandemic. You're gonna hear from our assembly speaker, Craig Coughlin in a moment, Senator Loretta Weinberg, Assemblywoman Verlina Reynolds Jackson, Senator Linda Greenstein, Senator Troy Singleton, and Senator Joseph Cryan. So I'm gonna turn right now, we do have a very special guest uh, who's waiting on the line, and that is Assemblyman Craig Coughlin, who is the speaker of our General Assembly here in New Jersey. And just like at the federal level, uh, generally there are three positions held by three people who are the most powerful in state government. That is our governor, that is our Senate president, and that is our Speaker of the Assembly, Craig Coughlin. Speaker Coughlin has represented New Jersey's 19th legislative district in the Assembly since 2010. He was sworn in as speaker in 2018, and he also serves as co-chair on the Select Commission on Emergency COVID-19 Borrowing. As you've heard before, and as you'll hear today, Speaker Coughlin has been a steadfast champion of property tax relief, uh, not just this year, uh, but in uh, the previous budget years uh, that we've worked on. Uh, but he also does much more. He has a special focus on eliminating hunger and food insecurity here in New Jersey. He was a champion of legislation to end surprise medical bills or out of network bills. Um, and it is under his leadership uh, that we are able to be here today to talk about the significant reforms of our nursing home and long-term care industry. Um, and so without further ado, uh, I would like to turn our program over to the speaker. I know he has a busy day ahead. So thank you so much, Speaker Coughlin, for being with us today. Okay. Thank you. There we go. Hey, Ev, how are you? Nice. I'm good. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for that awfully kind introduction. Uh, that, that's very nice of you. And, and good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you uh, as we, uh, yeah, it sounds like you have a busy day. It sounds like you had half of the, the legislature. Now, <laughs> take on them. Don't make us all commit to do something, okay? Because we got enough people here, to, then we'd have to actually do it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But it's always nice to be with you, and it's always nice to uh, uh, to see you, Ev. And uh, let me just say a few things. I think, as Ev, as you pointed out, the governor is going to sign the budget a little later on this afternoon. I'm going to head down there, and I got a couple things in between. But uh, I think this is a good budget, and I think it's a you know it's a challenging, awfully challenging time uh, for us. We had the you know we we have came to the conclusion that we needed a balanced approach to, to getting through the economic devastation that the coronavirus uh, 19 had uh, had dealt to the state, uh, which is why we balanced the, some tax increases with borrowing and uh, with some, some cuts that, uh, 
that, that we think uh, we're going to be able to uh, withstand, although we did restore uh, any number of, of things in the, in the budget. Um, and we've been working hard uh, in the assembly to uh, in, really in the legislature and with the governor to prioritize the needs of seniors during this COVID-19 pandemic. We understand that this is an unprecedented public health uh, crisis, which presents uh, unique challenges, both health-wise and economically. Um, this year, or this term, I should say, we, we formed a, an Assembly Aging and Senior Services Committee, uh, and they've been very instrumental in passing the legislation that, had, that you had referred to uh, in terms of addressing long-term care facilities. Uh, we were, I think we all watched in horror uh with as as it became apparent what was happening there um and so we went to work the the governor had the uh manit the committee or the manit health care company do do a report uh and there are senior services uh, folks get to work putting together a bill package that included a number of reforms uh, which were, are designed to provide for oversight, increase transparency, uh, and resiliency across what so my hair was sticking out on the side. <laughs> it looks great. Um, it was bothering me. Uh, <laughs> how vain we all are. Or at least I am, I guess. Um, one of the things that we did that I think is going to be is significant. Well, we, I think we did a number, any number of sig uh, significant things that there's a package, I think, of seven or eight bills. Uh, but one of them, uh, and, and one of the things that I, I think will help in, in a, a very much a, a, in, in, a, in a primary way is to increase the minimum wage long term care staff uh, so that the facilities can attract and retain skilled people. And that's really important. Uh, to be able to have sufficient numbers, to have people with some continuity who get to know patients uh, and recognize the challenge that they face. And we're doing that by boosting Medicaid funding uh, for nursing homes to support uh, their infectious uh, control protocols and creating a centralized long-term uh, care emergency operations center to coordinate uh, responses and communications during an infectious disease occurrence like this. All those bills have been signed into law uh, and there's more headed to, to the governor. When we passed the budget last Thursday, we passed some others uh, approving bills that are designed to combat uh, isolation and loneliness uh, in long-term care facilities and hazard pay uh, for those workers on the front line of the pandemic. Uh, we recognize that the, they were the very first uh, the, the first line, first frontline people, I should say, uh, before uh, many, many people got uh, engaged and, and at a time when we were all struggling to find uh, PPE and, and things like that. So um, we're going to reward those people uh, as I think we should. And uh, I think that's going to make for, uh, for a better arrangement as we go forward to make sure that people in long-term care facilities are safe. Um, I think it's important to remember that the COVID-19 didn't create cracks in the system. What it did was exacerbate them. Uh, and, and so we need to make sure that we're protecting these facilities as we go forward uh, and making sure that the, the, the people who stay there uh, are as well protected as we can possibly, as possibly can. Um, while those health concerns are at the top of all of our minds, I think the other thing that we can't ignore is the economic impact uh, that uh, the COVID-19 has had on the state. As, as you as you know, uh, the the estimate is that our revenues will be down some four five billion four to five billion dollars. Uh, fact, we borrowed four and a half billion dollars uh, to overcome that because we want to make sure that the essential services. Uh, that the state provides uh, are there so that people can continue uh, to count on uh, the things that they need to, to get through this. And I think that that poises us uh, to be in a good place uh, when the recovery comes. We're going to get through this, that's for sure. The question is when and what happens first. Uh, I, we're all holding our breath and keeping our fingers crossed and saying a prayer that the COVID-19 doesn't come back uh, in, a, in a worse way than it is right now in the fall. If it does, that the economic impact will be profound. 
uh, it means it'll likely to come back during the holiday shopping season, which means at a time when we have uh, the most seasonal employees uh, and at a time when uh, the sales tax is at its highest. And so uh, we have to be prepared for that. And that's why we've tried to provide for that in the budget as we go uh, forward. Uh, but we still made sure in this budget to, to <clears throat> protect the things that are important to seniors. Uh, the governor, uh, you know, in, in previous budgets, we've had to restore uh, funding for uh, full funding for the homestead rebate and senior freeze, but the governor had it in his budget. Um, and, I'm, and I'm happy to say that uh, uh, this budget does include that, it keeps the senior freeze um, uh, at the same uh, income level as it has in the past, $90,000. Uh, and those checks, just in case anybody's interested, will start to go out on October the 15th. Um, the other uh, thing we did was make sure that there's full funding uh, for the homestead rebate. And uh, uh, those will be, you'll see those on your tax bill. As those of you who may be familiar with that, you get a credit uh, on your tax bill. So it goes to reduce your property taxes. Um, and the other thing that we did that this year, what, what goes up, remember the retirement income, there's a retirement income exclusion uh, that goes up by another $20,000 this year. Uh, so that those of you who are eligible will be able to, uh, to not have to pay uh, income tax on that retirement income. Um, and, and those things together, I think, provide some tangible property tax relief um, for, uh, for all seniors. Um, I think the 2021 budget also does something strongly uh, to support the compelling need that we have to address hunger in the state. Uh, as Ev pointed out, I've, that has been something that has been at the, uh, at the forefront of my speakership. Uh, but most importantly, is something that is necessary for uh, certainly senior citizens uh, too often. Uh, and many other people in New Jersey just have to turn on the TV and you can see the lines at the food banks. And so we've added uh, $20 million to this year's budget uh, to help assist food banks, which I think will have a real positive impact on the, on the uh, challenges we face with food insecurity. Um, we also increased wages for frontline workers uh, for personal care assistance uh, and Pro, we've created programs for the deaf and the hard of hearing and, uh, and federally qualified health centers. So if any of you go to an FQHC, uh, there's more money in the budget for them. Um, nothing about the pandemic has made us change our commitment to uh, making New Jersey more affordable for seniors, uh, especially those who have lived and worked here all your life. Uh, we look forward to the better days. We have to get through uh, this challenge uh, and we have to be ready for uh, a bright future. And I think we've taken a step with this budget to do that. Uh, and I thank you, uh, all of you, and wish you the best. Uh, I hope you, uh, everything is well. I hope that uh, you stay healthy. Uh, I hope that we don't have uh, a pandemic uh, reoccurrence, you know, a wave, shall we say, um, this fall. And I think if we do, we're going to be you know, moving in the right direction. And I think we'll be poised uh, by preserving all those things that really matter uh, uh, to take advantage of that. Um, you know, that we were in a pretty good place last February uh, in terms of the, uh, the economy in New Jersey. Um, you know, we have now have our challenges with over a million people unemployed, uh, but uh, we'll never stop uh, thinking about seniors and, and ways to make sure that uh, we're there to stand up for you and, and be on your side. So thanks for letting me have a few minutes of your time. Ev, I have a few minutes for some questions if you promise not to be hard ones. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, again, for being with us this morning. Um, the, the accomplishments that uh, the state can claim under your leadership uh, are, are really um, commendable given uh, the nature of this pandemic, both its health and its fiscal crisis. Um, I'd also note uh, uh, within the budget that is expected to be signed today, uh, Medicaid funding is protected um, for our New Jersey Family Care Program, uh, which not only provides um, 
coverage for I think a third of our state's children, um, but is also a major source of funding for our long-term care facilities, particularly nursing homes and home and community-based services. So uh, we're very glad to see that as well. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to our folks. Oh, and I just wanted to mention, I did wanna thank this is a day at the Capitol and a lobby day. Um, thank you for uh, your efforts to um, be as inclusive as possible uh, in the work of the assembly and conducting hearings virtually so that uh, it's easier for folks like us who really can't travel or uh, would be putting ourselves at risk to travel to be able to participate um, in your work. Um, so I'm gonna just with a minute or two that we have left, India, do we have some questions in the chat for the speaker? We actually do. We have uh, Michelle Murphy who would like to ask a question. Hi there, thank you for allowing me to speak today. And uh, Craig, I wanna let you know, this is your favorite constituent in Sayreville. So it's good to see you again. <laughs> and, you know, last week we spoke about the horrible situation in the nursing homes. And I am so grateful for all you and your colleagues have done to um, put these bills forward to help out, especially the one on so social isolation. It was A4007 that has been put up for a vote. And, um, you know, your work is just phenomenal. I mean, you impressed me before, even more so today after hearing you uh, say the different work that's going on behind the scenes. So uh, thank you because- well, I did have a lot of time for questions, but if you want to keep talking, oh. I'll stay around. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the visitation provisions uh, on those uh, bills are very, they're crucial for the well-being of the residents. Thank you again for all you do. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. Really, yeah. to see you again. Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, we know you have a busy day. We're going to let you go. Okay. And um, uh, good luck this afternoon uh, with the budget signing. We'll be looking forward to hearing about uh, about that good news, particularly around the property tax relief programs. Uh, if, if, if the governor doesn't sign it, you'll be able to knock me over with a feather. So <laughs> I think so. Not signing, that, would be, that would be theater. Um, yeah. but no, I, I, I'm confident. Yeah, I know he's going to. And uh, I just, hey, one shameless plug for ballot question number two, which is the one, it's a vet is a vet. And what it does is it recognizes that veterans uh, who served during peacetime uh, made every commitment to, and, and willingness to sacrifice on behalf of the country. And, and for too long, uh, they haven't been entitled to a property tax relief. The, if you pass uh, ballot question number two, a uh, vet, whether they served the time of war or not, would be entitled, and then to their any surviving spouse, would be entitled to a $250 uh, credit against their property taxes. Strongly urge your support. And thank you all for letting me stop by. Uh, have a great day. I wish we really were in Trenton. Uh, I'd buy you all a cup of coffee. We Next do year. too. Next year. How's that? All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you, Mr. Speaker. Great. Go. How was that? Hi, everyone. Uh, well, that was wonderful to hear. Uh, just a few minutes from the speaker. Uh, as you heard, he's on his way down to Trenton, where uh, hopefully the weather uh, will hold out. Uh, the governor is expected to sign uh, the fiscal year 2021 budget on the steps of the War Memorial in Trenton. Um, and uh, as you've heard, it includes full funding for Medicaid, our New Jersey Family Care Program, funding for the Senior Freeze and the Homestead Benefits Program, funding for Secure Choice implementation, um, and any number of other priorities for AARP. Um, we do have uh, Senate Majority Leader Loretta Weinberg in the House, so we are going to hear from her in a minute. Just let me introduce her. Um, as uh, I like to say, uh, Senator Weinberg is uh, a hero of mine, and I hope to be just like her when I grow up. She has decades of public service here in New Jersey, uh, including being on the council in Teaneck, um, serving in our assembly, um, and elected to the state Senate in November 2005, where she currently serves as our majority leader 
and is on the Senate Judici Judiciary Committee, Vice Chair of the Legislative Oversight Committee, Vice Chair of the Senate Select Committee on New Jersey Transit, and serves on both the Joint Budget Oversight Committee and Joint Committee on Economic Justice and Equal Employment Opportunities. I don't even know where she finds the time. She has been a longtime champion uh, for issues that matter to the 50 plus here in New Jersey. Uh, she championed the Diane B. Allen Equal Pay Act, uh, the strongest pay equity bill in the country, legislation that established paid sick days for New Jersey workers, um, and for which she was awarded the AARP 2018 Capital Caregiver Award. Uh, she is now leading efforts to expand uh, that paid sick day law to ensure that paid sick time includes per diem workers in long-term care, and leading the charge to end legalized age discrimination uh, in New Jersey. We've also worked for a number of sessions with Senator Weinberg um, to establish a tax credit uh, for family caregivers um, and to uh, disrupt aging in every way here in New, New Jersey um, and to ensure that um, workers and residents of all ages can live their best and their fullest life. Senator Weinberg, we're so happy to have you. We're so happy to see you. Um, please join the call. There she is. Uh, you're muted, Senator. Can you unmute your, your screen? There you go. Yeah, uh, there. Are we yep. all set and you can We're, hear me? We can. Thank you, Senator, for being uh, here. Okay, Ev, it's great to see you. Wonderful even, to see you. Even one dimensional, as I said, when we all finally get out of this lockdown and find out that the world is really three dimensional, uh, <laughs> we have to be ready for the shock. <laughs> I think so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, in, in one way, I'm sorry that we're not all in Trenton to be able to do this in person, but I am thankful for the technology that is enabling us to see each other, even in this form, and to do it this way. Uh, I wish I had had a little bit of an interchange with the speaker, because I think one of the bills that we passed in the Senate is kind of lost someplace in the assembly. <clears throat> and that is the bill that would give sick leave to per diem workers, particularly in nursing homes that uh, is of interest, I think, to AARP for all the obvious reasons. And I'm hoping that we can get that bill posted. It did pass the Senate and hopefully we will see it posted and voted on at some point before the end of the session in the assembly. Uh, I think the speaker outlined and, and Ev, you kind of summed it up. There are many terrific programs that leadership got into this budget of interest to uh, our older population, uh, whether we're talking about the senior freeze or homestead rebates to make sure that all of these programs were appropriately funded for people who need it the most. I, uh, you know, I am, um, well beyond 50 plus <laughs> and uh, I guess am a walking postcard for uh, how older folks can continue to contribute to the world around them as is the AARP and as is uh, so many of your uh, lobbyists and the people who really keep the interests of senior citizens in front of us in the legislature. Uh, <clears throat> I think the whole nursing home issue has been such a trauma for the families, uh, for the patients themselves, whether we talk about the spread of COVID in these institutions and part of that is attributed to the fact that many of the workers in nursing homes are so underpaid that they're working 
two jobs or two shifts. So they work a seven to three shift in one place and then move to a 3.30 to 11 shift in another place and therefore contributed to the spread of the illness. Um, I think the social isolate, isolation has been heartbreaking, most particularly for the patients, of course, but really to their families who could not be there for their loved ones to hug them and hold their hand and share stories of happiness or sadness. So um, I, I think we're moving ahead step by step, baby steps. But our biggest problem right now is how little really the scientific community knows about COVID and um, how we are learning things each and every day. And I think the governor has done an extraordinary job of passing, you know, some of the tough bills, some of the tough executive orders that really ended up keeping people here safe. And I hope we continue on that road. So with that, I would be very happy to hear any questions or have any exchanges with anybody um, who is also on your lobby day uh, Zoom call. Yes. Um, again, thank you so much, uh, Senator Weinberg. It is wonderful to see you. Uh, we do hope that we will all be together in person next year. Um, and thank you again for your leadership um, on so many issues uh, that are important, uh, not just to the 50 plus, but, but to all New Jerseyans. Um, we agree. Uh, we are making steps to make the much needed reforms to our nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Uh, we will continue to work with you uh, to move that legislation, uh, providing paid sick days to per diem nursing home staff uh, and hope to get that over the finish line soon. Uh, we continue to um, work with uh, members of the Senate, members of the Assembly, um, to, uh, to, to move more reforms that are necessary, including um, efforts to evaluate our managed care organizations um, and their role uh, in, in, in supporting nursing homes during the pandemic, um, as well as taking a look at uh, whether or not we need to perhaps roll back some of the immunity provisions uh, that were provided to long-term care facilities early in the pandemic. Um, I, uh, I know that you have a busy day ahead and uh, we have uh, some other members of the legislature who are here with us this morning. Uh, so we're gonna let you go, Senator, and, um, and look forward to continuing to work with you uh, on so many of these issues in the future. Thank you very much, Evan. Thank you to AARP and to the vast membership, which numbers me too. Uh, for all the work you do on our collective behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um, well, thank you uh, to Senator Weinberg. Thank you to all of our members who are joining us today for our virtual day at the Capitol. Uh, it has been quite a year. It has been quite a budget session. Um, and uh, all of uh, the successes we've been able to achieve, of course, would not be possible without all of you uh, who work uh, tirelessly uh, to make sure our elected representatives know what's important to the 50 plus here in New Jersey. I'm really pleased now to, uh, to be able to introduce Assemblywoman Verlina Reynolds Jackson. Uh, this is her first time joining AARP's day at the Capitol. Uh, Assemblywoman Reynolds Jackson was elected to the Assembly in 2018, where she represents the 15th District in Mercer and Hunterdon counties. She serves as Deputy Majority Leader, Vice Chair of the Consumer Affairs Committee, and is a member of the Budget, Commerce, and Economic Development 
Committee and the Joint Committee on Public Schools. She has been championing efforts to expand uh, New Jersey's Earned Income Tax Credit Program, something I'm sure we'll hear more from her uh, as, as she provides us uh, with her remarks and her insights as to um, how we're doing in Trenton, what's happening in the state capitol, uh, and what the upcoming year is going to look like. So Assemblywoman Reynolds Jackson, are you on the line? There you are. Um, you are muted. Can you unmute your self? Yes. There you go. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. <laughs> good morning. So nice to see you and have you with us. Nice to see you too. Nice to see everyone. So I jumped on a little bit early and it was great because I wanted to scroll through and see how many people were on. And I tell you, it's just amazing. Um, I, although I'm new to the legislature, I do appreciate all the lobby days um, at the State House. And so to be able to see so many, uh, you know, virtually, I don't know if we've ever had that many physically there, but this <laughs> technology has definitely brought us together in a different way. And so I'm going to do some virtual kisses. I'm just going to blow a few kisses out there and a few hugs out there um, because I'm a hugger and that's what I would be doing if I saw you. Um, and so I, I just appreciate you all for inviting me to be on this call today. Um, and I, I heard uh, Senator Weinberg uh, mention um, the paid sick leave for um, per diem workers. And so I was like, oh, let me look into that because again, I feel like it's something that's very, very important. And I just think about, um, you know, this COVID and, and all of the things that it's brought out. Um, I have a, a, a elderly parent. She is home, but just the social isolation, you know, not to be able to be with her um, as much as I want to be. And then even in my role, making sure that I'm safe so that when I am around her, I'm not infecting her with the virus. It's just extremely important that we all continue to you know, practice those safety tips and washing our hands and using our mask and changing our clothes um, as we still are out and about um, dur during this. Um, and I, I can't, um, even I, I was thinking oh, about oh, sorry, again, yeah, social, social um, isolation yeah, that happens sometimes. I volunteer with a Mills on Wheels and so sometimes they may be the only people that they see when they come to bring the meals. And so again, you know, how do we make sure that we yeah, keep in contact with them um, just to mm -hmm. let them know that we're still here and that we're thinking about you and that okay, you so know much. we see you and we hear you. It's, um, it's extremely important that we continue to reach out during these very uh, difficult times. So um, I just wanted to open up with that briefly and um, you know, taking whatever questions you have. I, we did talk about, um, I saw her face on here before and now she's gone. Um, the rep um, that called, that we talked to all the time about the earned income tax credit. That's probably India, Assemblywoman. Okay, uh, I don't see her anymore. I'm like, where happened? Where did she go? It moved. Uh, I, I, she can hear you. She's still here. Um, and yeah, I think... Um, uh, thank you for your work, uh, expanding the earned income tax credit. And I know uh, uh, we've been talking to you about expanding it uh, at the ceiling. Um, yeah. And yeah. so I think, I think we have a question. Uh, I'll just uh, ask it uh, about whether or not, or where do you see us being able to expand the program um, to ensure that uh, so many of so many people who are working past the age of 64 now um, and would greatly benefit uh, from the tax credit program. Is that something you think we might see in the future? I do. You know, um, this budget has just been extremely difficult for us. Um, there's a lot of uh, programs, and we talked about them earlier with the senior freeze and homestead rebate being able to put them back in. Um, I tell you, um, expanding the earned income tax to take the cap off has always been the goal of ours. Um, and so we just took a, our first step 
in this, um, and th I'm going to call it a sprint instead of a marathon because I don't think it should <laughs> take that long. <laughs> um, but just in, in terms of making that first step. And so I, I believe that we'll be able to get the cap lifted um, sooner than later, um, especially with your efforts and advocating on the behalf of older working um, families here in New Jersey. Um, we know that the benefits are definite, would be definite, are, are definitely needed. Um, and so I just continue to uh, want to work with you all and we're gonna see how much we can put the pressure on. Um, this was my first year on the budget committee and I absolutely love it. Um, when I tell you we get to see all of the insides and be able to ask those difficult questions, you know, um, when we first started, we were talking about the senior freeze program and how it was gonna, what that impact looks like if it were taken away. And so again, we, we kept on advocating and, and, and expressing the, the desires that we know um, our, our seniors need. And so we were able to get back that in. And I think that was the same type of pressure we had for the earned income tax credits um, to make sure that that was able to stay in as well. And so I know we fluctuated a little bit with the star age, but the, the goal was definitely always to get the cap lifted. Um, and so thank you for all reaching out to us and being able to work with us. And that's what we're going to continue to fight for. Well, that's wonderful to hear, Assemblywoman. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, uh, and uh, we hope to have you back uh, for next year's Day at the Capitol, whether it be virtual or in person. Um, and uh, Thank you for your work on the budget committee. Uh, it's so important. Um, and we look forward to working with you and your colleagues to continue to expand the earned income tax credit. That's really important work um, for uh, all older workers here in New Jersey. So again, Absolutely. thank you so much for being here. Thank Thank you, too. It's a pleasure of being here. And I love, love, love the newsletter. Um, it's very informative and very, uh, I just kudos to the national team that puts that out. It's just, um, it's a great piece of information that comes through my household. So it is a great uh, piece. It reaches 800,000 households here in New Jersey. And uh, keep an eye out for the next issue. Uh, and I would say that to everyone here. Uh, it will be chock full of information about how to vote securely and safely uh, oh. in the November election. So thanks again, Assemblywoman. You're welcome. I'll see you soon. Bye now. Bye, bye now. That was Assemblywoman Verlina Reynolds Jackson, one of the newer members to the New Jersey Assembly. Uh, as you've heard, an enthusiastic champion of the 50 plus and our prime sponsor in the assembly of legislation to expand the earned income tax credit. Um, we also have uh, with us and who has just joined us an, a longtime friend of AARP, Senator Linda Greenstein. Uh, she represents the 14th legislative district in the state Senate now, uh, where she serves as the Senate's assistant majority leader. Prior to her election in the Senate, she represented the 14th district for 10 years from 2000 to 2010. Senator Greenstein has sponsored and co-sponsored uh, dozens of uh, pieces of legislation, including requiring public disclosure of medical errors at individual hospitals across the state, groundbreaking legislation at its time, um, legislation to uh, implement one of the nation's first uh, telecommunications do not call programs um, and has introduced legislation to provide seniors and the disabled with tax credits to enhance accessibility and safety in their homes when paying for necessary modifications. Senator Greenstein currently chairs the Law and Public Safety Committee and is the vice chair for the Environment and Energy Committee. She also serves on the Budget and Appropriations Committee, as well as on the Labor Committee and Joint Committee on Public Schools, another one of our elected representatives who I don't know uh, where she finds the time in a 24-hour day. Um, for all of her work, Senator Greenstein was named an AARP Legislator of the Year. And in 2018, she was awarded AARP's Capital Caregiver Award for her leadership in passing paid sick days for New Jersey work for New Jersey's working caregivers. 
Um, she is also, as you'll hear more about, a sponsor of legislation to lower prescription drug costs here in New Jersey by establishing a prescription drug affordability board. Um, and last but not least, at least for today, she has been uh, a, a vocal and effective champion and advocate for ensuring that we all have access to affordable and reliable utility services. So without further ado, Senator Greenstein, are you with us? There you are. You're muted. Can you unmute yourself? There you go. That work? Okay. That worked, yep. Yeah, we can Thank you so much. And you know, in 20 years in the legislature and being on many different committees over the years, I would say, and I mean this sincerely, I've had the most fun with AARP sponsored bills because all of these bills really help people. They've had a direct impact. And I know that over the years, uh, I represent Monroe Township and um, surrounding areas. And many of the people who've been very active members of AARP have been from those areas. I think things are changing a little bit, but nevertheless, uh, I think Monroe is probably a, a big part of your constituency always. So um, I really have always enjoyed my work with AARP. And you know, it's funny how, <clears throat> or funny and depressing at the same time, how some of the same issues are still there, but we're always putting some different spins on them and doing some different things. And by the way, Ev, I wanna thank you for all your work over the years. It's always been great to work with you. Um, on the issue of utilities, uh, certainly during the pandemic, we've had to be sure that people's utilities are not going to be shut off. Uh, so we've had, uh, there was an executive order from the governor and there have been a couple of bills about the idea that um, people can't have shutoffs. Now in 2018, we had a group of bills called Linda's Law, not named after me, um, <laughs> requiring utilities in New Jersey to check with residential customers before doing shutoffs since so many people might have medical equipment and, and other things where they just can't be shut off. So we've had those bills and certainly being laid on your bills should not be a life threatening experience as we said at the time. Um, so the public water, gas, and electrical utility companies have agreed to extend voluntary moratoriums preventing shutoffs until October 15th. I'm hoping that that will extend beyond October 15th, but that's what we have right now. And um, there always are many programs where qualified low-income and elderly families are able to apply for utilities. You can contact our legislative offices and you can get help with your utilities. There was also a bill during the pandemic that municipalities can't put liens against homeowners who are late on sewage bills. So we've had lots of bills like that during the pandemic to protect people if they have trouble paying their utilities. On the issue of prescription drug costs, um, you know, we have to make sure that that's one of the most important things to people. And there's a bill S1066, uh, I'm a co-sponsor on the bill, and it would um, pretty much establish a prescription drug affordability board. And it would set an upper payment limit that would apply throughout the state. Um, the board would take a number of factors into consideration when determining if a drug price leads to excess costs and if it does lead to excess costs, then um, there would be some controls. And up to now, we really haven't had controls on the drug prices, uh, but this would certainly establish a program where that would exist and it would benefit all consumers. So I'm looking forward to that. I don't think that one has been signed into law, am I correct? Correct. Uh, we're hoping it will be. And of course the CAD program, P-A-A-D, we're always making sure that that gets refunded. That's extremely important. Uh, many of you may benefit from that right now. It's certainly not a new program, but it's one that um, helps eligible seniors and individuals with disabilities save money on prescription drug costs. So we're always in favor of that, always making sure it's properly funded. On the issue of long-term care, which has been an issue for many years, 
for a number of bills on that. I'm a co-sponsor of S2785, which requires long-term care facilities as a condition of licensure to implement policies to prevent social isolation of residents of long-term care facilities. This is a big problem. We, we know that um, the pandemic has brought out um, the problems of loneliness that people have even when they're in their homes, but these are also problems when people are in long-term care facilities. So we wanna make sure that um, the facilities have policies to make sure that uh, this issue is taken care of. <clears throat> There's also a bill that requires nursing homes to maintain a certain supply of personal protective equipment for residents, extremely important. We learned during this pandemic how important it is to have large supplies of what we call PPE or personal protective equipment. And um, we want nursing homes, we want hospitals. Uh, we wanna make sure that there's enough equipment for everybody who needs to have it. Um, there's also a bill that establishes a New Jersey task force on long-term care quality and safety. Again, very important. And uh, you know, hopefully we'll take a close look at that. And finally, another one, um, S2712. This one is going through the legislature right now and it establishes minimum direct care staff and resident ratios in nursing homes. Again, extremely important. Um, to make sure that we have the right number of, of caregivers for the number of people who are in the facility. That doesn't always exist. And so this would set good strict standards to make sure that people have the proper coverage. So those are just a couple of highlights that would be important to AARP members. I'd be happy to try to take some questions and if I don't have the answer, I'll try to get the answer for you. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Senator Greenstein, and thank you so much uh, for all of the work that you do. Uh, you have essentially just outlined so many of the priorities that AARP has been working on uh, this year, particularly since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, reached, reached our state. Um, I just would mention that the legislation that you talked about to establish mandatory minimum staffing levels for direct care workers in nursing homes, uh, we agree is so very important. Um, and legislation that we've been working on with you and others in the legislature for five years. And so um, while, uh, so we are very uh, glad that the legislature has passed that bill and it is sitting on the governor's desk and, and we'll be urging that he sign that too. Um, India, if, I think we have time, maybe perhaps for one question, if we have one question from one of a member of our audience, India. We do, we have um, a question from John Hopton. John, you on? Yes, I am. Hello. Hello. Good Hello. morning, Senator. How I think you? you just, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. I think you've done a great job doing an overview. We were concerned, my wife and I, about the issue of the utility bills, and you've explained that carefully, but you mentioned October 15th being the end of the moratorium on those bills. Is there anything we can do to help extend that and uh, take it from there? Well, like anything else, I think that if you contact your individual legislators, the leaders of the Senate and the Assembly and emphasize how important this is to you, um, maybe we can all push to make sure that that is extended. Um, Ev, do you, do you know if there's a plan to extend it? I haven't heard that there is, but maybe there yeah, is. Yeah, um, to, your, to your point, Senator, um, uh, and, and we have some more information on this uh, as we get through today's day at the Capitol. Uh, we are encouraging all of our members to reach out to your elected representatives and to the governor's office um, to extend the moratorium. Um, right now, as you heard from Senator Greenstein, it is expected to end on October 15th. Uh, and that means that, uh, and we have just started to see some numbers uh, there are literally hundreds of thousands of households in New Jersey 
that are at risk of having their electricity turned off, their natural gas turned off, their water turned off, um, which uh, under even the best of circumstances is a terrible um, health and safety uh, catastrophe. But as we're trying to work through uh, this pandemic, it's, it's even worse. Um, we are in discussions with uh, members of the Board of Public Utilities um, to encourage it be extended, um, particularly since we don't have the data we need, uh, as far as we're concerned at AARP, to be able to make uh, a well-reasoned and informed decision about whether or not um, to end this moratorium. Um, I would also add, uh, Senator, and this is, we've just started to see these numbers um, and are asking for more detail, but everyone should be concerned about it as well. Of course, the number of uh, people who are uh, in arrears on their utility bill um, has increased significantly because of the pandemic with so many people out of work. But what we are also starting to learn is that there are many small businesses um, who are at risk of having their uh, utility services shut off because like everyone else, um, they have uh, suffered greatly during the pandemic um, and are just trying to keep their doors open and their businesses uh, from closing and so haven't been able to pay rent and pay utilities, pay property taxes, things like that. So and one thing I would say, um, we did do a load of bills to help small businesses. Yes, you did. Yeah. And so I, I'm hoping that they they've made a difference. I think they have. Yes. Well, again, Senator Greenstein, thank you so much for being with us today. We're going to let you go. We're certain you have a busy schedule. Um, and we hope that next year we will all be together in person. Um, and, uh, and until so. then, we will certainly be in touch. Uh, you're always uh, just a phone call away. Um, and thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Um, that was Senator Linda Greenstein joining, joining AARP's uh, virtual day at the Capitol, a busy day at the State House today as the governor is expected to sign the new budget uh, at one o'clock this afternoon. Um, we're going to turn now to uh, another friend and champion for issues that matter to New Jersey's 50 plus, um, and that is Senator Troy Singleton. Uh, who hails from the seventh legislative district uh, here in Burlington County, um, where he has been in the Senate since 2018. And then prior to his service in the Senate, he served in the assembly from 2011 to 2017. Currently he serves as the chair of the Community and Urban Affairs Committee, Vice Chair of the Economic Growth Committee, as well as a member of the Joint Committee on Housing, Affordability, Budget, and Appropriations and Judiciary. Um, Senator Singleton is the prime sponsor for, uh, as you heard a few minutes ago, legislation to establish a Prescription Drug Affordability Board here in New Jersey, which would be uh, groundbreaking legislation uh, to ensure that um, New Jersey consumers uh, pay reasonable prices for prescription drug costs. Um, he also was a champion for us and a sponsor of legislation along with the speaker to end surprise medical bills. Senator Singleton was also a prime sponsor of the legislation to establish the Secure Choice Retirement Savings Program. And we uh, are also working with the Senator and his staff on a number of these issues involving affordable uh, utilities. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn the floor, the virtual floor over to Senator Singleton. Senator, are you with us? There you are. You are on mute. If you can just unmute yourself, we can hear you. Good morning, everybody. How are you? There you are. Uh, first of all, it, it is uh, always a, a pleasure and honor, and I want to thank you all for inviting me uh, to speak to your members during your virtual day at the Capitol. And I echo the sentiments of so many others, and I hope that we will be able to be in person to see each other soon. Um, I first want to thank you both, Ev and, and Lavelle, 
uh, and all the members for your constant and continued advocacy on behalf of New Jersey seniors. It is not lost on me, uh, that advocacy. I actually look forward and look to the AARP for guidance on issues that are gonna affect seniors because I know that I'll always get um, honest and informative responses and work, having worked with uh, Ev, especially for so many years, um, I'm proud of our association together. Um, this is a, a bit of housekeeping, because I know you guys were just talking about it. On the utility front, uh, both Senator Gopal, Gopal and I, Senator Gopal out of Monmouth County and myself, uh, have the bill that you guys were talking about as far as extending the moratorium. Uh, that Senate Bill 2325 is currently in the Senate Economic Growth Committee. Uh, what I would ask of you, if you are uh, inclined to, would be to reach out to the chair of that committee, uh, my friend, Senator uh, Cruz Perez. I know our office has, and we will continue to, to ask Senator Cruz Perez to post that bill at her next uh, committee hearing. So again, that's Senate Bill 2325, and specifically it would prohibit an electric gas or utility from discontinuing service to a residential customer for utility non-payment uh, during an epidemic. Um, we don't want to see the moratorium in and folks get flooded with a bunch of bills and don't have the means to pay for it. So that is uh, Senate Bill 2325 over in the Senate Economic Growth Committee. Uh, your attention to that would be helpful and your advocacy on that to Senator Cruz Perez and to the Senate President Steve Sweeney uh, would both be equally uh, helpful. Uh, so my charge here today is to talk about two things. Uh, one, uh, my friend Senator Greenstein talked about is, is my bill uh, as it relates to the prescription drug uh, affordability uh, board. And again, ARP was instrumental in helping to craft this from start to finish um, and putting that bill together. It is currently in the Senate uh, Health Committee. Um, we're hopeful that the chairman, Chairman Joe Vitale, will be able to will move that, that bill uh, sooner rather than later um, because we are painfully aware that it's no secret that prescription drug affordability uh, was a major problem even before COVID hit and has only gotten worse. Um, prescription drugs uh, have been escalating at an unprecedented and unsustainable rate, uh, especially here in New Jersey, uh, for instance. So between, and AARP knows, these, knows this data well, because um, we, I'm sure we were able to work with them on it. Between 2012 and 2017, prescription uh, prices rose 58% in New Jersey, and, and nearly one in four residents now adjust their doses to save money. And if you take a step back and think about it, you know, our, our being sick should not put us in a poor house. And, and that is the debate that is raging, not just in Trenton, but in state capitals and our nation's capital all across our, our country. Um, but this idea that folks are saying, you know what, let me ration my prescription drug uses. Let me ration what is going to keep me alive and healthy because I can't afford it. In the richest country in the world, that is an indictment on all of us that we should not allow to stand any further. Um, it affects both, again, the, the, the health and wallets of every person who relies on these drugs. Um, and because it, it recently said that seven out of 10 Americans take at least one prescription drug and more than half take at least two. So if you think about it, that, that problem has only been ex exacerbated by the pandemic and is only getting worse. So with over a million residents out of work uh, across this uh, country, um, during the crisis and many facing unreasonable delays and unemployment payments, as we know, uh, many have faced that difficult choice of, of, of paying a mortgage or rent uh, instead of, you know, paying life-saving medicine. Uh, that is not rhetoric at all. That is the conversations my staff has every day. Um, and we know that this is especially concern for our seniors. Um, I often say that paying for necessary prescription drugs has become sort of a Hobson's choice, as it were, in our state with patients deciding to pay for medicine or go without. In the, and again, let me just underscore and, and reaffirm this point. In the richest nation in the world, and one of the wealthiest states in America, this is simply unacceptable and unconscionable. So the causes of the prescription drug problem are somewhat complex and, and sort of working through those, there's a lot of actors in this. So, but what we've tried to do is to address this issue. My friends from Citizen Action and ARP, we introduced exactly two initiatives that have the collective goal in our opinion of reducing the cost of prescription drugs for New Jersey residents. Um, one was the prescription drug affordability board, which is you know, what I'll, I'll talk about just a little bit more in detail. The other was our bulk purchasing agreement, which seeks to, to utilize our state's massive purchasing power to attain lower prescription drug prices. And if you think about it, that between Medicaid and public worker benefits, the state insures more than 
a million people. And the ability to leverage that buying power to reduce pricing is something that one of our initiatives is seeking to do. But the Prescription Drug Affordability Board, the sole purpose is to conduct a study of the entire pharmaceutical distribution and payment system, as well as examine what other states are doing to lower the pharmaceutical prices process. It conducts a study of the generic drug and identifies uh, pharmaceutical products that have unaffordability challenges, unaffordability challenges for New Jersey patients. It determines whether to conduct a cost review for prescription drugs that would likely be difficult to afford. The board will also determine if there is a need to establish an upper payment limits on certain products or whether or not to allow the importation of certain pharmaceuticals from other countries. The board uh, basically is comprised of five members, uh, three alternate members who have experience and expertise in healthcare uh, to, to try and help us sort of fashion this out. Um, specifically, the is a stakeholder board, which I, I know my friends from the ARP was were, were key in helping us craft in the right way, where members uh, additionally who have knowledge about the pharmaceutical industry supply chains and represent consumer and patient perspectives will have a voice in this process. It is our hope and our belief that these two proposals combined together uh, will drive down prescription drugs across through both collaboration and initiation, which will ultimately benefit the people of New Jersey. Beyond the work that we've tried to do on, on the uh, prescription drug uh, piece is work we're really focused on on housing stability. So I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes to talk to you about our efforts to help New Jersey families with mortgage and rental relief uh, if they're economically impacted by the COVID pandemic. Uh, in spite of the governor's eviction moratorium, there are still 16,000, over 16,000 pre-evictions notices filed in the state as of August and that number is only getting higher. The moratorium suspended all evictions and foreclosures until 60 days after the public health emergency is over. Once that moratorium expires, those 16,000 will frankly be homeless and will have a scarlet letter for mental applications, making them less viable and attractive to future landlords. It is estimated that approximately 40% of renters, roughly 450,000 or so, were unable to pay rent in August. And according to a survey by apartment list, 32% of renters failed to pay on time in July. And to show how big the looming problem is, according to the Administrative Office of the Courts, New Jersey's Administrative Office of the Courts, there were only 38 landlord tenant matters statewide in May of 2019. Now put this in perspective, one year later, the backlog was 14,085 cases. So in May of 2020, one year later, uh, 14,085 cases in the backlog amount to an increase of more than 36,000%. This pandemic is affecting us in so many ways and, and, is, and housing has been clearly designed as how it's done. If nothing is done and no funding or protections are provided, New Jersey will undoubtedly face a wave of evictions, homelessness, and foreclosures in the month of February. The COVID epidemic into a homelessness pandemic, and that will affect us all. All, whether you have your home and you're safe in your home right now, it will affect us all because our social services uh, price tags will go up to help address these issues. So we worked with my friends in the assembly on a proposal um, that has been colloquially known as the People's Bill. This legislation was born for me out of a, a local Morristown resident who came to me uh, with concerns in the early, earliest days of the pandemic. The gentleman and his wife uh, both were unemployed and self-employed. Uh, one was unemployed, the other was self-employed and concerned about how they would pay their mortgage going forward. The bill evolved very much since it passed the Senate in April and looked quite different when it was passed in the assembly in July. Frankly, right now it still uh, awaits uh, Senate concurrence, but the goals are very simple, to keep homeowners and renters impacted by COVID related uh, economic issues in their homes and to provide a repayment schedule for past mortgage and rent that remains the same without overburdening the renter and without creating a truly a deep financial hardship to the landlord. In short, the bill for homeowners requires mortgage lenders to provide forbearance to homeowners who attest that they have been financially impacted by the pandemic in some way. It would frankly prohibit the initiation of foreclosure. Overdue mortgage payments would be added to the end of the mortgage instead as a balloon payment once the pandemic ended. We think that's important because frankly, just on the natural basis, if you didn't have the money to pay your mortgage leading up to and through the pandemic, when the pandemic ends, you're, you're still going to be in that position. You're going to need time to get back on your feet 
So why not just put those payments to the back end of your mortgage, let people remain current and move forward. For renters, renters who've been financially impacted by the pandemic would not be subject to eviction notices during the public health emergency and for 60 days after. Landlords will be required to enter into an affordable rent repayment agreement with their renters. Uh, with individual uh, agreements, uh, it could be six months to pay each missed month uh, for up to 30 months. So we, we want to make sure that folks have time to get back on their feet in order to do that. For both homeowners and renters, this would not impact their credit score, and that is important. Uh, for landlords, um, currently the New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency created a COVID impact fund for landlords, and additional uh, funding has been made available, so they're opening up a new round of funding for, for landlords, because we also know while there is an effect on renters, there's also effect on landlords who utilize that money and use that rent money to pay their mortgage on their properties and pay their bills as well. So the state wanted to jump in to help bridge that gap as well. We encourage any landlords or those who know landlords to go to the New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency, the COVID Impact Fund for Landlords and apply today. In sum, uh, the bill to acknowledge the unemployment, sickness, and economic di difficulties that have impacted New Jerseyans during this crisis. It seeks to keep and provide housing security and avoid catastrophic life-altering evictions and foreclosures. We believe we've struck a proper balance between the needs of homeowners, renters, and landlords. Is it perfect? It is not. But we are in an imperfect situation and we need to do something. And that is our goal with making sure we keep people in their homes. Both of these issues, the drug issue and the housing issue, every step of the way, my friends from the AARP have been right there with good counsel and, and good ideas to help us move forward. As a legislator, as a policymaker, I depend on that. And I'm thankful for my friends from the AARP for never letting me down with giving their unvarnished and, and solid opinions on how we can make New Jersey a better place. Again, it's, it's been my honor and privilege to spend a little bit of time with you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if any are available. Senator, thank you um, so much again for being with us and for your leadership on so many issues um, and for that overview of the quote unquote people's bill uh, to ensure that uh, we don't suffer through a, a wave of evictions and homelessness at the same time that we're battling this pandemic. AARP supports that bill. Uh, we have uh, let your colleagues know that, uh, and we continue to work to try and get that bill uh, onto the governor's desk. Um, Senator, I know that uh, your time is short, and so we're going to let you go. Uh, if we have questions for you in the chat, we will forward them to your staff um, and to you. Um, and once again, we want to thank you so much for your leadership. Um, I speak for all of our members, but particularly for those who have joined us for our day at the Capitol. We so look forward to working with you to lower prescription drug prices in New Jersey and to make New Jersey a safe and affordable home for all. So thank you again, Senator Singleton. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thanks. Um, finally, uh, we are also going to hear from our last representative uh, who's scheduled to join us today, um, and that is Senator Joseph Cryan, um, who has also spent a career in public service. He serves now in the New Jersey Senate, uh, where he's been since 2018, representing the 20th Legislative District. He's previously served in the New Jersey General Assembly from 2002 to 2015, um, and prior to his election to the state Senate, uh, Senator Cryan was elected the sheriff of Union County. He has, uh, in the assembly, he served as the majority leader where he chaired the uh, dozens actually of committees, um, whether as chair or as a member. Currently he serves as vice chair of both the Senate Commerce Committee and Law and Public Safety Committee and is a member of the Joint Committee on Public Schools and the Select Committee on New Jersey Transit. Senator Cryan uh, is a champion, always fighting for the safety and dignity of long-term care residents, particularly now during the COVID pandemic. He has sponsored legislation that has recently been enacted to increase the pay for direct care workers, 
require facilities to spend 90 cents on the dollar on direct patient care, a first in the nation initiative, and establishing a long-term care emergency operations center here in New Jersey's Department of Health uh, to ensure uh, that uh, the tragedy that has unfolded in the early months of the pandemic never occurs again. He is also the sponsor of a bill moving through the legislature now that would dedicate a portion of the state's uh, personal protection equipment stockpile to long-term care facilities. So again, we're so thrilled to have Senator Cryan with us this morning. Senator Cryan, are you on? Senator Cryan, can you unmute yourself? If I did, we are muted now. We we can hear you. We can't see you, but uh, we can Probably hear how you. I look best, but um, <laughs> we can hear you. So please, thank you for okay. being here. All right. So, and first off, thanks. I, I heard you say I'm the last of the morning speakers. So let me, like Troy did a little bit. I do want to thank AARP for the advocacy, for the emails, for the attention. Um, for the direction for all of it. Um, if you don't know, and I'm, I assume you do, you make a real difference. And obviously the voice matters and I appreciate it very much. Um, I also wanna follow up and having had a chance to listen to Troy while he was speaking, I did take a look at the utility bill 2325 um, and in an effort of continuity, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I will also mention to the committee chair that that bill needs to move. Um, let me just mention a couple things. And since I'm last, I'll be brief. And if you have questions, great. But uh, Evie mentioned a couple of them. And I just want to make sure we took an aggressive approach with the long-term long -term, uh, nursing care facilities, especially in COVID and all that work with it. Just want to mention the, um, the fact that we did do the, um, the, the, the development of the statewide emergency pandemic response for the post-acute settings. Uh, you know, we put in the warning system. Uh, that we think is critically important for local, county, and state health offices, um, not only for the deaths, but for, to communic communicable diseases. Um, let's face it, we learned a lot of lessons in what not to do, um, maybe some that we learned what to do. Um, and certainly, I think the emergency response overall needed a coordinated effort that simply wasn't. Well, yeah, I know. The and legislation that was there and, and the tragedies that went with okay. it on a real human okay. level. You folks, I'm sure, heard the same stories I did about no. people being unable to say goodbye, people not, um, frankly, given the dignity and debt that they deserved as well. And I think uh, that bill will help with that. Uh, the dedication of the, uh, Eve mentioned it, the PPE dedication is obviously a lesson learned bill, um, but a pretty important one. And having stockpiles that make sense and being able to respond. We all, we all believe at least, at least I certainly I do, that there'll be a second wave and making sure that we have and are prepared appropriately. I'm amazed that we actually had to do legislation for that. But I felt it was not only important, but in some of the feedback, and I'm sure you folks saw it as well, where people were like, we have enough now, what's the issue? Um, I'm particularly glad that we move forward and making sure that the percentages were there and that people are rightly done. And the protocols. Um, one of the things that simply shocked me was the difference in protocols, and I had the good fortune, my chief of staff was very active in this, her name's Jess Cohen, um, and highlighted and really focused on COVID activities, the difference in protocols and the difference in how we manage that, those protocols, um, I thought was really eye-opening. So we, we provided what I think um, provides some excellent guidelines in terms of protocols and those sort of things. And the last is um, the minimum wage. Um, we put in for $20 an hour for a nursing home. Now, maybe that has a direct or non-direct effect to ARP, but I believe it does. It enhances quality of care, consistency of care, allows people to have an opportunity while they're working to focus on their job and not their next job. Um, as anybody, you know, if you got to work two jobs, you're always focused on the next thing and sometimes maybe not the current thing. Um, so I think I felt all those were important. There's a variety of others. Um, but I know you guys have had a long morning, I would bet. So um, please, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But know this, I'm not going to give you the whole speech. You guys know this. If you need something, have an attention, we want to be focused, I'm here. And that's been pretty consistent, I think, throughout the years without being boisterous about it uh, or boastful. But it's always going to continue. 
especially as I get closer. I'm almost 60. Um, well, Senator Cryan, thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, you know, we, um, we completely agree with you about the need to enhance and stabilize the workforce in long-term care facilities. Um, you don't have long-term care uh, without uh, a strong, qualified workforce. Um, it's these folks uh, who are just central to the quality and safety of care uh, for folks uh, in nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. And so your leadership in this area um, has really been terrific. Uh, the work that Jess and others on your staff have done are, is so commendable. And uh, we completely look forward to continuing our work with you um, and your colleagues to ensure the tragedy in our nursing homes never happens again. Um, we are gonna let you go. I know it's been busy. Uh, our folks uh, are at the end of their time, um, but we thank you so much uh, for taking a few minutes and being with us this morning. Um, we hope to see you in person soon. Look forward uh, to it. Very and, much look forward to it. And uh, we look forward to continuing our work together. Thank you so much, Senator Cryan. We'll see you all on the trail soon, I hope. Take care we, and thanks again go. for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Um, well, everyone, um, thank you uh, again for being with us at AARP's second day of our first virtual day at the Capitol. We have run a little bit over. Um, as you've heard, uh, we work with so many elected representatives, members of the legislature, um, and many, many um, are championing the issues that are important to you, uh, your friends, your neighbors, and your families. Um, Larry, if we could, um, could we go to the final slide of the presentation, our action page? Um, I'll talk a few minutes uh, before we wrap up about um, how you can take action on so many of the issues uh, that you heard about today from your elected representatives. Um, you can go to uh, the first link here uh, to take action and urge your elected representatives to protect utility consumers uh, from shutoffs of services uh, to uh, urge the state of New Jersey to a suspend unnecessary rate increases um, at a time when so many um, are struggling just to meet their basic needs. You can go to www.aarp.org slash save our seniors to contact the governor to urge him to get the three bills that are on his desk over the finish line. Uh, those bills are so important. Uh, one will ensure that virtual visitation is provided in long-term care facilities during periods of public health emergencies when in-person visitation is not allowed and to improve communications between facilities, residents, and their families. There's a bill that will provide hazard pay to direct care workers uh, who served so valiantly uh, and continue to serve during the pandemic. Um, and finally, legislation that will, for the first time in New Jersey, establish mandatory minimum staffing levels uh, for direct care workers in long-term care facilities. And then finally, uh, we didn't get to talk about it much today, but I think everybody knows it's coming. Uh, we have a big election coming up in November. AARP is of course a uh, fiercely nonpartisan organization, but what's important to us is that everyone can vote safely and securely and that the candidates who are running for office, whether it be president, our members of Congress, um, or perhaps any local elections that are up in your district, address the issues that are important to the 50 plus at the federal level that includes uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and lowering prescription drug prices, as well as saving our seniors in nursing homes. You can get all the information you need about how to vote safely and securely this November by going to aarp.org slash NJVotes2020. 
Finally, before we wrap up, I would just encourage any of you who have questions that we were not able to get to, please keep them in the chat and we will route the, your questions um, to either your representatives or to somebody here on staff. Um, I want to thank our amazing volunteers who have hosted our Zoom virtual day at the Capitol today um, and without whom you would not all be able to be here. That's Michelle Murphy, Larry Finch, Jim Stint and Dan Zevi. And let me also thank our amazing staff um, who supported and put together a today's event, India Hayes Larrier, Rachel Auerbach, Susan Coda, Maria Guerra, Usfa Rizzi, and Crystal McDonald. Thanks again to Lavelle uh, for being with us today and for your welcoming remarks. And that will do it for me. Thank you all. We'll see you back in Trenton either virtually or in person. Have a wonderful day and we will keep you posted. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>